This is Mouth Media Network, the business of being heard. If Daffy Duck, Foghorn Leghorn, and Marvin the Martian all had a baby together, that's pretty much this show. And that is very, very worrisome. This is Funny People Talking. Hi there, this is Michael F. Shine. I am the author of The Hype Handbook, which is coming out with McGraw-Hill on January 12th. I am also the owner of Microfame Media, which is a marketing agency. And I would rather be experiencing a firebombing while shopping in Ikea than listening to funny people talking. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Funny People Talking. I'm one of your hosts, Mark Rako, and my friend, she's got a big smile on her face. When doesn't she? It's the the almighty, the incredibly powerful, the very, very empathic Dresden Engel. How's that? How's that, Dress? I loved every second of it. After two <laughs> varies, though, I was a little nervous. Really? Very, oh, oh very... true. So, so all you, you took from that, that all you took from that was my repeats. That's the point that you made out of all that was the repeats. You picked on me. After no, there I was praise, and it was so good. I figured there was no way to go but down, and therefore oh, my hesitance is kicked that in. Is, that's our show, everybody. And so, that's, that's right. Uh, what uh, about me? I know. Welcome to the show, everybody. Glad to have you here, of course, with us. Also, as always, pretty much always, our producer, Elsie. Hey, Elsie. Hey, how's it going? Yo, yo. Elsie, what's playing on your uh, your soundtrack today? What's running through your uh, your music, your system, your earbuds, whatever? I just want to do end of show food. Okay. She, you're, you have singular mind today? I have an actual story and um, okay. cool. a lot to say. A lot yeah. to say. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be the so- uh- it's that's the all Elsie. I can think. Of. That's it's all the, I can think about. It's the Elsie show. That, that by the way, that uh, the, Elsie sent me a message right before the show. It said, "Can we do uh, yum or yuck early in the show?" Because I have a real reason behind us. I'm like, okay, you got it. All right. You heard someone peeking out from behind our our voices there, saying, "What about me?" And what about him, everybody? His name is Michael F. Shine. He is an author, a marketer. He is a hype master. He's very, very. Awesome. I'm more of a thigh master, Mark. (laughs) And he just earned his salary right now. Very good. Thank you, sir. Welcome to the show, Michael. So glad to have you here. I'm excited to talk about your book and uh, how humor and hype, both H words, connect. And uh, I'm also really interested to know what the F in your name means. There's so many possibilities. Why do you call yourself Michael F. Shine? All right, explain, but then let us guess the F, okay? Yeah, I don't know which question to start with. No, start um, with why you have an F. (laughs) I don't know, because I see myself on the same level as like a David Foster Wallace, so I'm really big into the three-name thing. You know, Why why don't you just spell it out then? Yeah. No, it's really because until about three months ago, I was Michael Shine, and then I found out that there's some sort of mystery writer named Michael Shine who has the URL, so I figured it'd be a good idea to separate myself so from now on michael f shine that's 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 what we're doing but it's the it's really my middle initial so gotcha are you gonna take a guess Dresden? well yeah i mean i want to say francis but that seems too obvious that's not true but weirdly enough on my linkedin url it says michael francis shine and i have no idea how that became my linkedin thing so that's Hmm. weird filibuster a couple of levels Mark, yeah. guess guess the F. Um, it's not filibuster. It's uh, Furio. N- no. No. Elsie, guess the F. I was gonna say first because he was the first one. Michael uh, first shine like F I R S T or F U R S T. I because you're first. I was the one, first. I one. was first and am first, but that is incorrect. Is is it Frank? No, that's what most people guess, though. Okay. I don't know a lot of male F names. Do you want me to give you a hint? Sure. Yes. All right. Hint, I, hint, um, hint. I'll give you one of two hints. So have you ever driven from Fiat. Atlantic City oh. to Fiat? Fiat is incorrect. 
from Atlantic City to Philadelphia or, or the other direction? No. no. Well, there's a service station that might have helped, which plays a key role in my naming. Finnegan? That's another story. No, Finnegan is, is not. It, it, the first part of the name sounds like a word that children can really make fun of you about. Fuel. Fagan. No. Michael Should I just tell Fagan. you? Yeah, yes, I, I'm, please. Put us out of our, our pain here. Ah. Farley. Farley. Oh, far. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> you know how many times I've, my, I have a 10 year old daughter? I lived with that my whole life and then it went away for a long time. And now I have a 10 year old kid and I hear this. Yes. A lot. That's Fartly awesome. for anyone who couldn't make the connection. Awesome. Yes, right. awesome. Fartly. Yeah. And and was it that kind of like scarring that caused you to just be an F versus a three name person like a Cosby kid? No, he dropped it all together like until Cosby he kid. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah. What, what was his name? Kareem Abdul Jabbar. No, what no. was his name? Uh, no, that's the no, basketball. The, player. Half of the cast had three names. Yeah. No, but what was Theo's name? That's who I'm thinking. I'm Malcolm horrible. Jamal Warren. There right, you yeah. go. You put yeah, that yeah. out of yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do we have time for the story of my naming? Because I am a narcissist. Well, let's save it for when we talk fully oh. with you. And, yeah, because he, uh, he mentioned let's circle. He mentioned truck stop or something, so I am intrigued. All right, mm -hmm. I, I, we will definitely circle back to the naming right. later. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So we're looking forward to talk. But we've lots ahead of the show. We're going to have an exciting yum or yuck installment from Elsie. She's just chomping at the bit or champing at the bit. I can't remember which it is. And of course we'll play an improv game, our salute to Tina Fey and a Dresden moment, I hope. Uh, and then anything else that might happen. Plus all about Michael F. Shine all coming up a real super, super quick. I have a question for Dresden. Dresden. Uh -oh. I have to, I know I have to ask you, <laughs> there are a lot of pencils in your presence right now there's one oh, behind yeah. each ear there's a couple stuck in your hair your yeah. hair is twisted around the back with a pencil i see one hanging around your neck there's a couple in your pockets I see you're holding one in each hand what is with all the pencils well i like to get straight to the point oh. and um you know it's my subtle way very subtle of letting my boyfriend know that he's number two and <laughs> not number one in my life <laughs> so he's not very sharp. So, oh. um, you know, I, I'm going to try to see if he can, you know, figure it out. So I just thought I'd go subtle for a little while. Good. No need to be graphite about it. <laughs> oh. Did he go to an Ivy League school? I... Like the University of Pennsylvania? <laughs> oh. Right. Hey, I led you yeah. there. Oh, I see. Well, get a I grip, a, everybody. I, I was going to, oh, that was good. I was going to say it, but I was a little like, I don't know, yellow and afraid to oh, say it. Oh, my. I think Excellent. we killed it. Did we kill it? <laughs> if we didn't, did we, we, defi we definitely would. <laughs> and see. All right. Elsie, tell me to start the show. Start the show. <laughs> From the Mouth Media Network studios in New York City, this is Funny People Talking with Mark Rago, Dresden Engel, and Elsie. All right, everybody, we're so glad you're here. Before we get into anything, anything else... It is time for a very early installment of our wonderful segment called Yum or Yuck, where Elsie brings us something that she's found, something culinary, a snack, a food, a drink. So from somewhere in the world, she's discovered it. It's always interesting. Sometimes it's yum. Sometimes it's a yuck. And since we're not all in the same place, we can't enjoy it together, but we can certainly enjoy it from afar. And then Elsie will rate it on a scale of chickens. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> that's how it goes. So, Elsie, yeah. fill yeah. us in. What are you so excited about? She loves bacon. She's cantankerous in her cats and a jazz band. She's the producer. It's Elsie. All right. So this one has a story, which I usually don't have. So. Okay. We'll get to know. it then. So relish it. Um, all right. <laughs> so I, I had this... Uh, Someone that actually co-hosted with us before, um, Michael Serpy. Do you remember him? Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Michael okay, F. So Serpy. He, 
<laughs> he told me about um, this odd fellow's bodega brothers um, ice cream extravaganza. That, that's, so the, like, that's the brand name, Odd Fellows. Yeah, okay. Odd Fellows. Yeah. So um, I said to myself, "Self, get this because it's cool." So I did, and then I watched the tracking, and I watched the tracking, and I kept watching the tracking, and I figured after four days that the ice cream wasn't going to be too happy. So I um, surprisingly got it, and it looked like it had been drop kicked from Brooklyn to my place. So I contacted Odd Fellows and I let them know. And someone's name who rhymes with FedEx was responsible. And um, so they were gracious enough to help me out. And um, I, I actually got this today, one hour before showtime. So this is amazing. And I want to give a big shout out to them for being so accommodating and cool yeah. and understanding. And Sweet. they agreed four days is not acceptable for ice cream to be shipped no matter whether you have dry ice or not so the packaging i got to talk about that because it's cool it comes in this styrofoam container in a box with a bunch of dry ice and then within that is a packet and this packet has uh this photograph of their shop in brooklyn and then there's also a sticker that says Odd Fellows times Bodega Boys. There's another sticker that says I love Odd Fellows, but it's like the tongue and the mouth, kind of like the stones kind of uh. the deal. By the way, I'm doing these in the order of what I like the most. So now I'm getting to the really great ones. So there's this other postcard and it's got a Odd Fellows ice cream feet featuring Bodega Boys. And then it's like a scratch off giant lottery ticket. So you scratch off these these three tokens and you could win a discounted showtime subscription. You could get 10% off odd fellows. You could get a free six pack. Like who doesn't want that? That's amazing. I'm going to save the grand finale. So I got one more thing. So then there's like a, a giant menu and the menu talks about these flavors. So I'm going to tell you the flavors. Okay. As marketing people, Michael, I'm impressed. How about you? Beyond. Yeah. It's awesome. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, all right. So the, the names of these flavors, there is a host of cupcakes, which is like a hostess cupcake, like a ding dong kind of thing, you know, with the chocolate and the cupcake and the white stuff in the middle. And then there's this uh, sweet tea lemonade one. And then there's one called bacon, egg and cheese, which I'm dying to try because, you know, bacon, egg and cheese ice cream. And then yeah. we got budget breakfast, which is a coffee ice cream with honey bun chunks. Bad and then we eat. got... Chico Ooh. sticks, which is that old fashioned candy, right? And then counter crunch, which is light caramel, sweet cream based, butter crunch, honey roasted peanuts, chocolate covered pretzels. Goodness. So, yeah, that's what you so got. Which one did and you then, get? Um, yes, all of them, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and then, so then the grand finale awesomeness, I gotta say, is that you also get one more postcard in here. And on this postcard is a lactate little one serve so that if you're lactose intolerant you can still eat this ah that's very I'm smart like, yeah. i've never heard of that yeah that's really yeah. that's really amazing i just have one question for you before you go on elsie are you being paid in some way for this because you are selling the crap out of this no i bought this because i wanted it okay and i, and I actually I wrote to... the name of this place down i've not I, after you gave yeah. that description yeah the way they handled stuff with me was super awesome and um just the flavors are so unusual, so I want to try it. But I like Odd. Their name's Odd Fellows. And then these are ice cream, and I love ice cream. So it's just like, no matter what, I think it's going to be a win. So shout out, Brooklyn, Odd Fellows. Thanks, guys, and gals, and everybody. But not the people that rhyme with you know what. So the first one I'm going to try is the Host of Cupcakes. All right. And I made little bowls for myself, so I have like that experience. So Host of Cupcakes, one, two, three, go. My my moral that I took away from this whole thing was never use Slednex uh, delivery service. Actually, that was terrible. I'm sorry. No, it works. It works. Okay. <laughs> it gave um, her time. Right. It gave her time to save her. I'm sure there's circumstances <laughs> in which that company does succeed. It just seems, unfortunately, we've all had a number of instances recently when it hasn't. So therefore, yeah. I'm not a fan right now. No, you could. You should have seen the box. It literally looked like it exploded. It was ice cream everywhere and totally jumbled and awful. So the host of cupcakes tastes like a hostess cupcake. Tastes kind of like a malted chocolate ice cream with little flecks of chocolate in it and little like a little white creamy thing going on. 
and it was good. So I'm going to give it a 70 out of 72 chickens. Nice. It's a, it's a yum. It's a definite yum. Can I ask a quick question about that one? If, yeah. if somebody didn't want to wait for sled facts all those times and they, they just wanted to get their ice cream and it's not sold in retail yeah. as far as you know right now, couldn't they you just can buy go to, You can get it? Go retail? to one of their shops. Yeah, oh, okay. go to one of their shops. But I can't guarantee what <clears throat> flavors they have. Right, but because can't I you think just, it's like small it's batch almost, kind of. Video. It's almost like they're giving you an idea to make your own, right? Like you could go um, buy the cupcake, chop it up, throw it in some dollar yeah. ninety nine ice cream, and happy Hanukkah. But you <laughs> could go go on their website because right. they're always up. They're always updating with flavors too, so you can find locations. You can find out how to get it shipped to you. It's it's good. Just do it. All, All right, right. So, so next, Chico sticks. Chico sticks. Ready and go. Oh, wow. That tastes kind of like um, if you liquefied a butterfinger and froze it. Maybe that's what they did. Wow. Yeah. All right. So that's, that, that's very sweet. So if you like sweet, that's your way to go. I'm going to give that one a mm-hmm, – uh-huh. I'm just going to say yum. I'm not giving numbers. All right. Now we got – How many are we doing, what, else? <laughs> All, all six flavors. Okay, six. I'll stop talking so you can get through that. That's why I said, yeah. So, budget breakfast. Budget okay. breakfast. Okay, okay, okay. All right. By the way, none of your business is totally stalking me. I'm not joking. This is like, go away. All right, ready? One, two, three, and go. While she's tasting, Michael, I'll tell you, uh, Elsie, her voice occupies a small percentage of the show generally, so I feel pretty good giving her a little extra real estate here to to work with. Oh, with, I agree. With. I just didn't realize I kept interrupting her savoring. All right, budget breakfast. So that was the coffee ice cream with the honey bun chunks. Oh, yeah, yeah, I wanted the that one. The coffee is very um, present. It's delicious. The honey bun chunks are small, but good. So, my, yum. My nickname in college, honey bun chunks. Oh! All right. Now I'm going to do um, the Just Bodega bodega Counter Crunch. Does I did, it, by the way, for those who does can't Does it smell see like me, cat? Sorry. It's, uh, I did little Post-its so I don't screw up. So I put Post-its on my little ice cream extravaganza. So I know which one is which because I'm organized. All right. So ready and one, two, three, go. Mmm. Mmm. That was our first audible. Mmm. That was really good. And which That's one? a 70, 72 out of 72 chickens. And that one was? This one's, this one's a Bodega Counter Crunch. So okay. this one, just for a quick review, is the um, light caramel sweet cream base with the chocolate-covered pretzels, butter crunch cookies, and honey roasted peanuts. Nice. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Eat that. That's like okay. they took the the airline snacks and threw them into ice cream. <laughs> there you go. Pretty so much all the airline snacks. It's so yeah. fly. Observation. Mm. All right, I have two to go. I'm trying to be fast, so I'm be a like you know, sweet tea and lemonade. All right, get out of here. You no, you got to say that with a nice southern drawl there, Elsie. Sweet tea and lemonade. Thank okay. you. <laughs> that did not sound southern at all. Oh, <laughs> that was Boston, Brooklyn, Southern. <laughs> um all right so this definitely sweet tea a hundred percent it's like let it if you're thirsty just let it melt you know, is drink it, it more like a like sorbet it does it taste more like mm. a sorbet this one yeah yeah cool. yeah all right and so now we for the grand... sherbet where i grew up oh yeah the sorbet when yeah. did it become sorbet i've always when wondered did sherbet that. drop the r i've seen sherbet Anyway, sure bear. Is that I think sure you added an F, was... They lost the R. <laughs> I, I think oh. actually it's the other way around. Didn't they add the R back in because everyone said with an R, so they just made it be R. Oh, I have. To I think Google it's actually. Press. I think it was originally sherbet. I think it was. Really? Um, Google I think so. So, all right, last grand finale: the bacon and eggs. Are you ready? And one, two. Okay, I gotta just describe this. It's chunky, and you, and I'm assuming it's like little flecks of bacon, like bacon bits, and uh. And then it looks like there's hunks of scrambled eggs in it. So if you're someone that looks at it and goes, hmm, no, then you may have a visual thing going on. But I'm going to eat it. So ready, one, two, three, go. Oh, wow. Wow. I did not expect that. All right. So those chunky things that look like scrambled egg melt in your mouth. I mean, literally, like it was scrambled like. scrambled egg? No, it's sweet. It was oh, sweet. Okay, good, good. And good. it was like, it, mel- it just melted like egg foam. 
So I guess like an egg cream or an egg foam or kind of, and then the bacon is real bacon. It's not fake garbage bacon. It's like, if you like bacon, you eat this bacon and it's bacon and I like bacon. So you eat it. What I'm saying is yum. All right. So I'm going to say it. Odd fellows, you did it. And I salute you in all ways. So yeah, go buy this and um, enjoy these flavors because they're definitely not the norm. And I don't know if they're permanent. So there you go. All right. I'm done. I love it. Every single person listening is now going to the freezer to get ice cream. Yeah, it's good. I I am really hungry now. And I wasn't hungry when this started. And I feel like I feel unfulfilled. But like we, you know, the norm, the norm is that we would have, you know, if we were together and not COVID quarantine, you know, we would have all been together and I would have handed it out for everybody. So I do apologize. You don't get to partake, but maybe someday you can, you know, come back to the studio and we'll all eat something festive. I would like that. That'd be cool. All right. Moving Thank on. Thank you, LC. LC right. with the win many times over. Yeah. So is there an average score, would you say? Are they all in the 70, 70 range? Yeah, between 70 and 72 chickens out of 72. Beautiful. I, I, don't, have any, I don't have any complaints. I, I will eat them all with much uh, glee, yeah. My guess is that your cat nutting your business will be uh, licking the sides of those things, too. Yeah, seriously, he's driving me nuts right now. All right, all right thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, a salute to Tina Fey, a quick Dresden moment, and an improv game, and then all about Michael F. Shine right after this. What if your idea of paradise is having some alone time? Do you still need two tickets? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, This is Funny People Talking. As an American, there is no greater privilege and responsibility than choosing who will represent you and your family to determine the course of history, your lives, the economy, your health, your safety, On November 3rd, please choose to vote. To vote early, or if you need an absentee or mail-in ballot, please visit vote.org. Your future self thanks you. All right, everybody, real quick, Michael, we pay tribute to Tina Fey. We give a prayer to the comedy gods every episode, putting out to the universe... A big, big hope that maybe someday, somehow, Tina catches wind of it, if you will, and comes on the show. So I'll lead it off. Michael, no pressure, but if you feel like you want to join and add to the chorus of voices, you're certainly welcome to do so. Oh, universe of comedians Tina. and humor. And funny. Tina Fey. I want to Please deliver Tina Fey. Come on Fey to us. the show. I'll let you She's the best. We love Tina. We need Tina. Oh, this is really good. 30 Fey. So I'll share, I'll share it with you. Tina. 50 Rocks. Fey, come on, Tina. 72 Rocks. Amen. Thank you very much, all. <laughs> Okay, on that note, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to take a leap of faith and believe that there may just be a Dresden moment. Dresden, who knows many, has had contact with many a celebrity, may have another story in store for us today. You never know who it could be. It could be (laughs) Faye Ray of King Kong fame. It could be Philip Seymour Hoffman with a quick acting tip. You never know who... Oh, who is your story about today? Okay. Oh, Thank you just you. say whom, oh, whom oh, is whom, your oh, story whom. about today. Yes. And now it's time for Dresden Moments. So, you know, I had a couple of in mind and I thought, let's see what works with Michael. Well, since two things, when he said he'd rather be doing something other than listening to funny people talking, he said the word firebomb. And yes. my name is Dresden. You figured and out where I was inspired. That's the thought. Did you really? Oh, did you? Yeah, did you Kurt Vonnegut little, me? Yeah, a little you bit. You Kurt yeah, Vonnegut me. A little bit. I mean, right, I'm really know, impressed. The name, yeah. Sounds good. I'm really impressed. So <laughs> I'm going to tell two stories where I thought I was Miss Thing, and then two celebrities maybe didn't remember my name in the heat of the moment. 
So two different celebrities. First, we're going to go with old school Tony Curtis. Okay. Some like it hot. Total like, oh, everybody loved him, right? Beautiful, handsome guy. So we're working together and we're doing some PR stuff and we're hanging out and having a ball. And, you know, like he's kissing me up and down my arm in front of all the people. And we're just having a great old time. He was like, you know, a grandpa because he was older and I was younger. And then when it comes time for he's going to talk about me publicly and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, my God, my time. He's going to say something. And every single time he rest referenced me, I became the cold tablet Dristan. <laughs> then, wow. then, for those of you who don't know me, very, very fortunate to have done work with Eddie Money. Wrote his musical with him, starred in his musical with him. Uh, he passed away a year ago. Also wrote his biography in 2020. Very, very fortunate girl. So we're talking real friends. Well... Eddie has a son named Desmond, so sometimes he'd get confused. So TV anchor friend of mine's like, wow, man, in the interview, Eddie mentioned you two times. He said, you are the best publicist. He goes, I'm going to send you the sound files. Yeah, I wish I could use them because he called me Desmond both times. <laughs> and scene. So the moral wow. of the story is oh, no. hang out Take with it. stars, but don't expect any to believe that you're really hung out with the stars. That's right. You got to just take it how it comes, right? You got to take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. My name is Mabel. You said it's Mabel. It's Mabel if it gets me a job. He kind of like did a Dresmond. So every <laughs> single person on my team in my PR office calls me Dresmond. Not nice. It's not nice. Specifically because of that story. Oh, 100%. Oh, Because he didn't boy. do it once, but twice. Oh, you know what? God. Because what? the news anchor said him to me, I actually have these clips. What? Here. We got a fantastic publicist, yeah. and she also plays my mom in the play, and she can belt out this tune. I mean, I started crying when she did that song, I Only Want the World for You. She's very, very good. Oh, my God. I can't <laughs> believe you have that. Oh, wait, there's one more. One more. Okay. I got a great PR person, Desmond. She's fantastic. <sighs> oh, my God. All right, so there were some interviews where he did say my name right, so we thought about okay. splicing it in, but then it would be like, <laughs> yeah, I have this great publicist, Dresden! Like it just would right. flow. So, <laughs> so all right, thank you so much. Good. It's not on all my right. website, obviously. And scene. And see, all right. Well, great. Uh, that should be the name of this show, by the way. And scene, really. Yeah, I say uh, it all the time. That is the greatest. Thank you very much for another great Dresden <laughs> moment. All right, so let's move on with our game. I actually, Michael F. Shine had a game selected. <laughs> Thank you for saying the full name every single time you refer to me. I, I so when you're that. on you just, Amazon, yeah. don't forget to <laughs> yeah. ask. Yeah, no, I really. I, it, it's, it's, I'm trying excellent. to reinforce that, you know, into the. Yeah. the, the <laughs> Make sure you stuff. f so, your Google search. That's right. Oh. On this particular point, I had a game picked out, and I've modified it slightly, <laughs> given the modification of your name. So the game. <laughs> The, the 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 game is usually called the big announcement. It. He has set the theme for the whole show just by That's adding right. an F. Just by adding an F. Everyone else is like, we never heard of this guy when he was Michael Shine. Why is this such a big deal? This is Michael F. Shine. F. Like podcast. The artist formerly known as Michael Shine. That's right. Uh, so anyway, so the game the game is called the big announcement usually, uh, but I've decided to call it the big effing announcement. And the, <laughs> Okay, and the reason is because what will happen is you take an infinitesimally small thing in the world. This is similar to our game, the eh, news. You take a small announcement, something that's inconsequential, very inconsequential, i.e. I stubbed my toe or I finished my broccoli or whatever, and you turn it given a theme uh, a, a, a yeah a theme a, a way of announcing uh, given by another another member on, on the show here into a massive all important world shattering announcement okay however the twist given your name will be that the first and last words of the announcement must begin with the letter F 
I'm a very low IQ individual, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to do this. I believe you will, because we'll demonstrate oh. first. Okay. We're not just yeah. going to throw it to you. So uh, I'll demonstrate as an example. I have never done this before with the, the F first and last word, so it'll be a challenge. But we'll give it a try. So what I need is from one of you, uh, Drez, I'm going to challenge you to, to start with this. Give me a very inconsequential thing you would not normally make a big announcement about. And the style of announcing, for example, live in the field, it could be a sports caster, it could be a play by play, it could be a movie trailer, it could be, uh, it could be uh, a Mussolini, you know what I mean? It could be like. Okay. Yeah. Some way of announcing. Okay, so I'm going to do the announcement genre as well as the thing? Yes. Okay. Dresden bought new bras. She okay. decided to not go underwire anymore. Okay. And the thematic genre is going to be a movie trailer. Okay. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm trying to remember his name. What, what, um, what, what's his... Uh, um, okay. From Michael Bay. She's lost everything. <laughs> but a new hope has arrived. They're called underwire bras, and Dresden has purchased a large quantity. Can it save the world? And will the new super bra change the tone of brassiers and boobs everywhere? <laughs> Coming next week on Friday. <laughs> it was very weak, but yeah. that's I can honestly say that was better than any actual <laughs> Michael Bay movie that has ever oh, been made. Slam. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It didn't save so, the world, but the underwire bras saved the small dogs and cats. So we're getting they did. as <laughs> they I did. walked by. Ah, they bada did. Boom, bada bing. Okay, so let's go with Elsie next. Elsie, I'll give you your choice here, and then you'll yeah. give one to Michael, and right. Michael will give one to Dresden. How's that? My thing for you is you're out of ice cream. <laughs> and it's a big announcement. And uh, you're out of ice cream. And I want you to do it in the style of a Southern Baptist preacher. <laughs> Good one. <All> right. <clears throat> Freezer. Empty. Raise your hands and pray to the gods of ice cream, the makers of those frozen treats. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Don't let your freezers be empty. Oh, no, God, no. <laughs> Find it in your heart. Mm -mm. Because at the moment, Praise my Jesus. heart is frozen. Mm -mm. Very good, very good. Woo Elsie, woohoo. All right. Let's go with Michael. Michael, you oh. can do it. I know you can do it. All right. Elsie, will you give Michael, uh, Michael F. Shine, a, um, <laughs> a, 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 an announcement and a style? All right, you're going to announce a a day trip to the aquarium, <laughs> <laughs> and um, your style is going to be a horror movie. So is it another is it another trailer? But it's a horror movie trailer. No, no, he's in the horror movie. You're it's, in the horror movie. He's he's going to the aquarium, but it's a scary one. Am I the slut who gets killed, or am I the uh, virgin <laughs> that's who your, survives that's, at the end? Oh, that's your decision. Okay. You you surprise us. All right. Oh. So here you go. It's I, your horror. It's your horror all right. movie. All right. I know you can do it. Go for I it. I might Mike. do something different. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> if you free me from this cage and give me a nice Chianti and liver, we will see the fishy, 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 fishies. <laughs> Very good. I there think go. I think the quantity of Fs at the end of that made up for the no yeah. F in the beginning. So I applaud <laughs> you, sir. I forgot well, to do well Fs. And that was a lot of Fs, actually. I didn't even think of the Fs. That was just I the, forgot you know, about the Fs. That's okay. Fooey. All right. So, so, so Dresden. I should have done Buffalo bit, uh, bit the other guy, you know? 
take me to the aquarium. Oh, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it puts the lotion on his skin. It yeah. takes the man to the aquarium. <laughs> oh, my God. My wife freaks out when I do that. She does not like yeah. me doing that. Oh, uh, my God. Okay. So, uh, one more. Uh, Michael, why don't you give Dresden an Be announcement? Kind. Be kind. An announcement. Oh, no. No, she's cleaning up on this uh, this batting order. You get to, you can give her what you need. Okay. Sorry, Dresden. Apps. Love you. My anyway, apps. I'm not Dresden's favorite either, apparently. Michael F. Shine, give her a uh, an announcement and a style, any old style. Okay. A fly landed on my food. A 30s radio announcer. Oh, wow. Oh, love it. Love it. We're here, friends. <laughs> We're here at the Ritz Carlton where a horrible thing has happened. And we have gathered people are running in hysteria. All because of a gentleman named Michael F. We only know the initial F. Has had a fly land on his quiche. Some people call it quitchy. Some people call it quiche, and some real men don't eat it. But Michael F. <laughs> must be a real man. Okay, I'm seeing some more hysteria. No, 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 no. He's coming this way. Fly, fly, fly. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. She did it. She did Not it. Not my best she did moment. It. Not uh, my best I, I liked it. I, I liked, liked it. it. I liked I it. Did. No, I did. Very good. You know what I honestly think? I think Michael won this round. Really? I think he really won this yeah, round. I did I so. win? Yeah, yeah, you won. You won. And you were like all doubting yourself. No, making, low expectations. You're all mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm not funny. I can't do it. And then there you are. I all hustled right. you. Is why that <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you did. You hustled. All right. Quick break. And then back with All About Michael F. Shine. Be right back. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Funny People Talking and Elsie at Elsie the Producer. And please, for the love of all that is holy, subscribe to the show and leave us a damn review and a really, really good rating on iTunes. Pretty please? Thank you. All right, Michael, uh, let's get into it. So I would like to start out with this question. You know, it's funny. When I met you first, my recollection is that your whole business is about helping other people promote themselves. That's what your company, Microfame Media, either is or what it's morphed into. But my question is, is... How much have you learned from doing that that you're now able to apply to yourself? Are you taking all the things that you've learned from doing it yourself and helping other people promote? Where did this knowledge come from in the first place? That's a good question. I mean, it's, yeah, it's all kind of interconnected. So the thing was, so when I, when I started my so-called career, you know, coming out of college and everything, I had never in my whole life wanted to be involved in business in any way, shape or form. You know, I, uh, when I, for years and years and years, I wanted to be a novelist and then I got into music and I really wanted to, you know, write songs and change rock and roll. And I didn't know there wouldn't be a rock and roll to change, but that's, that's kind of what I saw myself doing. So, and I did that. I mean, I played, I played in a band, out of college and you know i was really into punk rock and stuff like that and huh. and stuff like bowie and things like that so it was as much for us about what i now call hype as it was about the music to me like the theatricality and the promotion was was part of the art and also i'm not sure i'm the world's greatest singer or guitar player i mean i played with some pretty good people but as a result we kind of made up for that by getting the workout and we're done. We had a following. So we did all kinds of antics. I mean, I used to dress as a nun and like walk around the Lower East Side and then go on to stage. And, you know, uh, we we got ourselves on Showtime at the Apollo knowing full well we'd be booed off, you know. I mean, we would would do things like that. And we didn't succeed, quote unquote, but we had a following. I mean, we we had a residency at Arlene's Grocery and we sold it out on a Wednesday night and we did some, some neat things. We had fans. 
but you know, it broke up and I was depressed and, 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 you know, looking back now, it's funny that I thought that that I was going to become a rock star because that doesn't happen very often, but at the time, you know, being young. And so I got a job, I, I needed a job. You know, I started working in this extremely like brass tax kind of industry, you know, it started off, they had a startup division that was like in entertainment, but then they shifted everyone over and it was a like the call center industry, like answering the phones for corporations. And I wrote scripts and then I did different things and I learned a bunch for like three years. And then eventually I um, hated it. I mean, I was there, but I work hard and I, I became a vice president of solution development. And to this day, I don't know what that means, Ooh. even though we worked every weekend. Yeah, but it was, it was really not, I was not happy. And so eventually I quit and I decided I was going to become a writer, but like a, a freelance copywriter, content writer. And I almost lost like the year's worth of savings that I that I had saved up. I, I didn't know how to bring attention to myself at all. And so after reading every marketing and sales book and and, and still doing horribly, I, I said to myself, well, what if I started doing some of the stuff that I used to do, like like mischief, you know? And and so I got really interested beyond like the rock managers and things, I started reading books about cult leaders and propaganda artists. And my whole idea was like, there are these things about mass psychology that just work. Now, it's possible that doing those things are just horrible, awful things to do. And if that's true, I don't want to do that. You know, that's not why I decided to leave my job so I could hurt people. But if it's just that that's the way human beings act in groups and that bad guys take advantage of it more than good guys, but some good guys like rock managers or whatever take advantage of it. What if I could do it ethically? So that's what I started to do. And uh, the first thing I did, I wrote this article for Inc. magazine called Why Gary Vaynerchuk is Flat Out Wrong. He's this big marketing guru. And he responded to me that night and I was a nobody. And he responded to me that night on video and he was like sweating and really aggravated. And what was tell. it and that you said about Gary? What did you proclaim? First of all, I was very respectful. I didn't yeah. troll him. And I, I don't think you should troll people. That's that's easy. Yeah. What I said, so at the time I was selling an approach to, I was selling packages of like content that I could create very efficiently. And then I would sometimes consult and set people up to yeah. produce their own content. And I used systems and templates and stuff. And he was going around at the time with this hustle stuff. And he was telling all these young people you know, when I get up at three in the morning and I sit on the toilet and I take a shit and I'm tweeting from the toilet and that's how dedicated you have to be. And I'm like, what a stupid way to like live your life. Like the only way to be successful is to, you can't even take a dump without tweeting. Like that's seems like there's a better way. So I wrote an article about how the only person really benefiting from this is Gary because he's created himself as sort of this guru. And really what you need to do is be efficient and build systems. He didn't like that at all. And he responded to me with a lot of a lot of peak. Um, and it was like the start of my career, you know, the second phase of my career. I mean, all these people lambasted me for a week. I got twi 50 Twitter followers in like an hour. And um, I started to gain followers because it turned out there were a lot of people who thought like me. So that was the beginning of thinking that there are these principles. And now I call it hype of like, non-traditional marketing, the best marketers aren't marketers. So I used that to build my agency and we do it for clients and it, and it worked well and I built a career from it, but I'm still a writer at heart. So I wrote it, a book about it. I mean, it's, I'll, I'll read you the subtitle because I never remember it, but it explains what the book is. So it's 12 indispensable success secrets from the world's greatest propagandists, self-promoters, cult leaders, mischief makers, and boundary breakers. And yeah, I fully intend to use it to promote the book and everything so does that answer your question it was very long yes That's very cool <laughs> yeah. Yeah. can you imagine now, if you... i said no <laughs> and, and yeah, i, don't, I know <laughs> i don't want to take you down a rabbit hole but did you That's okay. did you get the byline in ink because you pitched that particular story about gary or were you already one no. of the writers no actually that was one of the things that was had nothing to do with my ability to hype things up and nothing to do with with what i learned later that was me that was luck, you know? I mean, I, I was living in Brooklyn at the time and I worked at this place called the Brooklyn Writer's Space. And if you're a, a quote unquote serious writer, you can work there even if you're not published or whatever. But because it's Brooklyn, there are a lot of really talented and even famous writers who work there. So, you know, there was this woman, Diane, who really hooked me up. I overheard her on the phone because she was doing a side gig as an editor at Inc. and we were friends. 
cool. saying, you know, I, I got to find free, right. You know, and basically she said writers to write for free. And at the time I was more than happy to do that. So I said, I'll write for free, you know, so that was how it happened, but that was a real foot in the door. And I had a blog, so I was able to send my writing to ink. Like you had to apply and they liked my writing. So cool. Michael, what do you think hype is? Like, I think it means a lot to a lot of different people. I actually think I had this conversation with you a long time ago, what yeah. the actual real meaning of hype is, because I think it's it means a, like marketing. What is marketing? I think it means a lot of different things to different people. Social media means different things to different people. So what is hype and what does it mean to you? I think I'm 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 very very consciously taking hype back and trying to repackage it because I think it's a distinctly negative word, you know, in most people's minds. I mean, I think it means it means hyperbole, right? So which means exaggeration. So it's like talking about overly talking about things where the meat of the stuff isn't really there, you know? But I see it where, where, where my definition got inspired by was hip hop, like the hype man. Like if you see a rap group, they actually have a position, not as much anymore, but they would have a position in, in the group, like Public Enemy or whatever, called the hype man. And he was part of the group and he would get up and he would be the advance man, like the circus advance man. And it wasn't negative. It was cool, you know, because it was part of that swagger. So the way I've defined it, I kind of want to take it back the way the word queer was taken back. I mean, I hate to minimize that because they're in two different universes. But to me, hype can be part of the, the work itself, part of the art. So to me, it's just any sort of set of activities that drives large numbers of people to get excited enough to take the kind of action you want them to take. And it can be done very negatively. It can be done for really bad aims, but it can be done for really good aims. I mean, I talked about how it works in, in performance, but I don't know, Martin Luther King, if, if you look at, at what he did, he was a master of hype, the way I define it. He didn't just do nonviolent resistance. He did it when the press would be there and made sure they got the shots he wanted them to get. He packaged really radical ideas with really familiar language, like the Declaration of Independence, you know, from sea to shining sea or whatever that famous speech is. I mean, that's a hype tactic. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, I think of it as amoral. And it's interesting when I teach public relations at the college level, the main thing I see throughout the entire semester is never use the word spin because right. spin has the similar connotation that it means you're lying. Oh, we can spin that, right? right spin right. doctors, the whole thing. Right. So the word hype, I mean, I I think it's perfect for the book because you're trying to make a point and you're pointing out examples of it through the ages. And I cannot wait to read the book for that reason. Thank you. Right? Because P.T. Barnum's in there, right? You know, it's funny. I, I kind of notoriously left it out. Like every <laughs> book I've seen about this topic, <laughs> they talk about P.T. Barnum. So I was like, I'm not going to write about P.T. Barnum. Can you just yeah. rattle off a few of the names of the non-P.T. Barnum types? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, Trump was a big inspiration, and we can talk about that. But but yeah, um, the- I, I, I do want to talk yeah, about that. I, yeah. I think there, that's a really relevant example of. Yeah, Edward Bernays who was actually called the father of public relations. Yep. Um, Amy Semple McPherson, who was kind of the first celebrity preacher. The Fox sisters, who were the first uh, spiritualists. They, they started lived seances. Up here, up here in Rochester, New York, where I am. Did they live in Rochester, yeah, New York? Yeah, yeah, just outside. I know that... They- Oh, that's right, because they they rented out the hall to try to bust them as fraud. It turns out what they were doing was snapping their toes, toe joints, against hollow walls. Like, they, they admitted it years <laughs> later, and people still wanted to believe it, because it was after the Civil War, and people were so sad and had such a void that they wanted to believe they were talking to their, their dead relatives, you know? You know, there, there, there are so many. Um, Shep Gordon, who was Alice Cooper's manager— Wallace Fard, who was who started the Nation of Islam. I talk about Richard Branson. Um, I talk about Edison. Yeah, there's just a lot. Is there any George Eastman? No, but he that would have been a good example. Actually, yeah. I didn't. Why? I didn't use talk, him. talk about yeah. Edison and Eastman. Why those are examples of good hype? Well, Eastman, I, I, I'll let you talk about. It. I've only heard about it in an ancillary way, but I know that he was very good at drumming up excitement. Edison is a really good example because while he was a talented inventor. He invented from scratch very few of the things he said that he invented. So he, he and alone, he, didn't, he certainly didn't invent anything alone. I mean, right. Tesla did, and he died broke. 
Edison, if anything, his greatest invention was the industrial lab, like a lab that created practical technology. He did not invent electric light. He refined it. And when he did create the light bulb, he couldn't figure out how to light any area bigger than lower Manhattan. That took Tesla and Westinghouse. So there, there were, he, he wasn't even in the room when the, when the movie camera was invented. He was off testing some weird mining equipment that never got used. And someone in his thing, create, his lab created it. So the phonograph was his big invention. And it took 15 years to become commercially useful. But he built so much hype around that that he made his name. So what he did was he created himself into a celebrity. He took his weaknesses and turned them into strengths. So he was very socially inept. He didn't like people very much. He just liked to work all the time. He didn't like small talk in the sense. So he would arrange for the press to always walk in while he was toiling away. So like they would come in and he would be like sleeping at his desk or he circulated this story where someone came in at, at midnight and, and he was like, oh, yes, there he was, he was like at the office and they said, you should probably go home. And they said, oh yes, it is my honey. It is my marriage night, you know? So he would like circulate these stories and he just created this image. I mean, that made him huge. Okay. So this brings to me such an important point. What is the difference between marketing? I'm giving you an example, marketing hype and being a con artist. Because if the way that you get someone to your brand or to what you do is through these ancillary activities that are maybe not even true, but they're just meant to lead you to your doorstep, is that being a con artist or is it hype? And then the, on the other hand, I think of something like the uh, Blair Witch Project and the things that that team did with creating, making it look like it was a real story. Yeah. And, the, and which is like exceptional marketing. But is that hype or is that marketing? Like, where's the line? Well, part of it is just that these are words, right? But I think if we define, so I think if you're deceiving people, if you're overtly deceiving and harming people for your own benefit, that, that's being a con artist. Okay. Right, right. I think some of the same principles are at play. So Edison didn't really lie ever. He just he made did, sure they saw things that yeah, happened, even if he right. recreated them. He, he framed reality. Like all of us oh, okay. have a, a lot of things going on. And no, really, I think there's a big difference. He worked those hours. Alternative You know facts. what I mean? No, see, I think it's different, though. I, I do. I think that hype is amoral. It's not moral and it's not immoral. So you can use their psychological principles. So, for example... Human beings, I've read book after book and looked at different principles. We gravitate toward figures who, who present their best traits and who work around the clock on be behalf of humanity. So like Tony Robbins, who, who knows, I'm not crazy about his morals, but you know, he talks eight hours a day, cult leaders do that. But Thomas Edison did work those hours. And so he he had one or two of two choices. He could have minimized it and been like, yeah, you know, uh, no, but he made it into part of his story. You know what I mean? Martin Luther King, if he was really so altruistic, he could have done nonviolent protests without the press there. Why didn't he just protest? Why did he do it when the press was coming to town? Why did sure. he alert the Because that got a better end but he didn't lie those people were being hosed down you know what i mean so i think being i think and we can talk about various people people use hype to con people and in fact one of the reasons i wrote the book is because i think con artists take to it more easily because they think the world ought to be a certain the rest of us think what you think the world ought to be a certain way we ought to be able to just do the right thing and blah 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 so not that it's the wrong thing but we ought to just have our work shine and let people find it. But con artists have no such delusion. So I want to put these tools in the hands of more Martin Luther Kings and fewer con artists. Right. And then marketing. Yeah. And marketing to me, marketing is just any activity you do that gives you a chance to get more business. You know what I mean? Like if standing on a sign gets people to knock on your door and pay you money, like I think that's marketing. Right. The basic def differences between public relations and marketing by textbook definition before digital media was essentially you don't pay for PR other than the people yeah, doing the yeah, manpower, right, but you pay right, for marketing. It right. was a 
fine line now. You know, it's very muddied now because you know, social media tends to live under PR, except for when you pay for the digital marketing. You know, when you mentioned Edward Bernays, right? So it really comes down to taking the power of an idea and just seeing if it works, right? So yeah, right. Beach Nut was one of his clients. Right. And they I were, use this example, yeah, by the and, way. And they yeah. were, they needed, bacon sales were down because people were eating very heartily after the war. Then the 20s came and people were being a little more health conscious but he needed to get bacon back on the table. So he just established this. You can say there were some lies where he stretched the truth about how bacon and eggs were the ultimate healthy breakfast. And he made it work. He just did. Um, there's so many ways he made it happen. But see, there's a lesson in this that that is so perfect that I think shows how these things are amoral. Even though, So I think Edward Bernays was a deeply immoral human being, you know? <laughs> Yeah. No, he did terrible things. So he was more but, spin than, yeah. I know. Did he invent well, Bernays sauce? He did not. <laughs> but he might have told you that he had. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but this guy, the, the, the lesson is he lied. He knew it wasn't healthy. But what we can all learn from it, the real principle at play, is that hype artists build, make it always seem like the thing that's happening is grassroots, but they cultivate kind of like a secret society under the surface. So the reason he was able to do that was because he had this extensive network of influential physicians who yep. would spread the word for him. So the lesson I bring out like in the book and in general is don't take the lying part. That was just f a fun story. Take the part that you're never going to get anywhere if all you try to do is build Twitter followers one by one by one. You need to have this web of highly connected people. And there are ways to make that happen, but not be so obvious about it. So and that's we, the lesson. And there's yeah. nothing immoral And you about can that. pay a Kardashian to plug your product. Sure. Like that, they, people can, can be bought, right? So in a decade, I'm sorry, a century plus century, yeah. since Bernays, we're, we're really still in the same spot. I mean, he he took uh, the women's rights movements and he told them, hey, walk up and down, make the I men know. mad, <laughs> yeah. have women smoke, and we'll call him torches of freedom, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so every day- You know I, a lot about this. That's cool. Yeah. I teach me art at the college level, <laughs> yeah. so I love it. Yeah. I can't wait to read your book, yeah. even though you left up P.T. Barnum. Just kidding. So at the end <laughs> of the day, you want to take back hype. I want to take back public relations. Public relations has a bad rap because people think it's spin. And you want to know something that's interesting? You know what happened in 1913? In 1913, all government entities no longer could use the term public relations because it was equated with lying. And so that's why everything at the White House, et cetera, is press secretary and director oh, of information wow, and things like that. They don't use the word public relations. Well, how far we've come. <laughs> so, mm. And anyway. you know what the original word for public relations was? that they changed it from propaganda. That's what Bernays oh, originally yeah. wanted to call oh, it. No, yeah. he, he wrote a book called Propaganda. Yeah. And as government started using it negatively, he changed it to public relations. And, and so I'll just come back to something that every person listening to this has a personal brand. Every person listening to this often needs to sell themselves in some way. And you do something at your company that I refer to as story mining, and you refer to it as content casting. And at the end oh, of the yeah. day, people really need to know what their differentiators are. What do you do differently than the other financial planner in the room? What do you do differently than the other person auditioning for the play or whatever? You know, we also get people thinking. We also remind people in, you know, in our field, Michael F., people in our field... <laughs> People are counting on us to help them craft their stories and their image. And, you know, so it doesn't always have to be unethical. I won't work for anybody who ever is going to make me want to lie. The thing that taught me that it doesn't have to be unethical is when I would like read these stories about, say, David Bowie. And there was no line in his mind between self-promotion, music, and visual. Like it was all part of the art. So like he would create alter egos and then show up in a limo before he had any money and make sure that press was there. And he wasn't doing it just to get famous. That was part of it. He was doing it because that was part of what Ziggy Stardust was. That was part, he like created an alternative reality game before those existed. And that's beyond not just, oh, we try to do it in an unethical way. That's like art. That's extremely creative. That's extremely ethical 
he could have done that to 14 people and we would have never heard of him. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. So we've talked about extremes. Let's go from Ziggy Stardust to one of your clients. We'll, we'll land the plane here. For our listeners, what advice could you give to somebody, right? Maybe they really want the attention of a Ziggy Stardust, but they're not going to, you know, go eyeliner and spandex and glitter. <laughs> could we could we add a layer to that, Drez? Okay, cool. I, I've been, I've been, no, I've been sort of sitting on a question. I feel like it could be answered in, in, in tangentially to, to what you asked. And, and Michael, this goes back to the sort of, excuse me for using this word, but the authenticity of a message around what brand or person it's built around. And that approach has to be aligned with who that person actually is. So you have different clients who are doing different things, who are writing about different things, and they are different. Yeah. But you have certain standard things that you know do work. It's part of your skill set, but it's probably also one of the biggest challenges is is making the execution of those things be specifically aligned and built around that unique story, that unique person, while still trying to find a way to utilize tried and true methodology. Yeah. So maybe you could approach Dresden's question a little bit in terms of talking, maybe using an example of that to show about how you do work versus the, versus the way that David Bowie did. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of times people will call me up and, and sort of inquire about possibly working with us from our various marketing, you know, channels or, or, or what have you. And I'll almost always say to them, you know, as part of my little opening shtick, there are a lot of great marketing agencies out there, but one thing that I do it, that's very different than anyone else I know of is that I admit something. And and that thing is that marketers don't know what they're doing and, and they laugh always. And, and I say, you know, because you can understand the principles and that's very important. You can understand the tools, you can have a knack for it, but the idea that you're going to do the same bunch of things Every single time, create four landing pages with four sales funnels and an Instagram, and that's going to work hmm. is crazy because, you know, <laughs> but, but because by, by the time everyone knows the trick or the method, it's too late. And every industry is different, just like you said, Mark, right? So what we do, and I think this is for everyone, is what you got to do is start with a hypothesis based on, on tried and true principles and then test and do small tests until you get an equilibrium. So like, for example, so I might say, okay, um, the Edward Bernays principle, which I call piggybacking, the idea that it's a lot easier to create a very um, powerful, as I call it, secret society and network that's really tightly woven and piggyback off their success than doing it from scratch. So that's a principle that I believe works, right? So, okay, what's a method that we might use to do that? Well, okay, let's try an experiment. Let's do a podcast and interview people on the podcast and then try to make friends with all the people you interview. Okay, that, that, that's an experiment. Now for this particular person, we might launch the podcast and the person is really flat on the podcast or for some reason their message just doesn't resonate with an audio argument. But we learn something when we send out this particular email and the one person wrote the email, someone responded to her writing style. So then we do it as a blog instead. And the blog takes off and she and, and they form all these relationships on the blog. So like there are these principles that are timeless and you can build a hypothesis around those principles. But eventually you just need to do small tests. And the, the idea is that you got to make the experiment small enough so that you don't lose too much time or money while you're doing it. But eventually, once you find your magic combination, it's going to last for a really long time. You know what I mean? And I, and I also find, you know, and this is just a comment just to leave our our listeners, because everybody's involved in some way, either their own brand or promoting their business for themselves or for whom they work, is I often will start with what's your dream? You know, in a perfect world, what, what you know, what do you wish your, your company is being described as? What do you wish? And 99% yeah. of the time, they're not where they want to be. And it's as simple as, okay, let's start how to get there. So it's, um, uh, I totally, yeah. for what, sure. Yeah. You yeah. agree with that? Yeah. So everybody, I what, do something similar. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, so what's your dream? Let's figure out how we can make it happen. Let's figure out how you want to be described in all your social media pages and, uh, yeah. you know, pause and reflect and everybody can do that. So cool. That's, that's oh, a, I, I love it. I feel like I just went to college. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> so, Michael, let's put a cherry on the top here with this question, which I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up. Let's talk about humor and hype. 
And whatever comments you can make about how humor may or may not be a powerful tool in hype. And can you give an example, if I put you on the spot, of a way yeah, that no. you've seen humor utilized very effectively to, to create great, great hype? Yeah, it's funny. I, I think hype is, in some ways... In some ways, the thing that that draws a line between the scummy con artistry and the life enriching kind of hype often is humor. You know, that's often the thing because mm -hmm. you can really use hype to, to troll people and really hurt people and this sort of thing or, or con people and trick people. So speaking of P.T. Barnum, right? So P.T. Barnum was in a way a con artist. But no one ever resented him, and he's still an American hero. And when you read about why that was, it's because he always made sure that the people he was selling kind of knew it wasn't true. Oh, like you a know little, what I mean? little wink and a nudge yeah. kind of thing? Everyone bought. People bought in. They knew, you know, it was, it was part of the show. People never left his museum or his circuses or whatever worse off. And then he found them. They were entertained. They were enriched. They whatever you know, and and I think it's a little like that. Like there, there's a guy named Ryan Holiday who you may have, may have heard of. He's a big he, he's a big writer now, but he was the um, head of marketing for American Apparel, like when he was 21, and he ran these campaigns. And he's not very funny. I mean, he's very serious. I, I, he probably has humor in him, but I think he just he's a stoic literally like hey, that's his philosophy stoicism and he kind of plays that out but you know he had um sasha gray the porn star in an ad for american apparel and she was kind of this sex positive you know one of the the first like out there sex positive feminist kind of porn stars for a clothing company wearing nothing but socks like naked like that's funny. That's ironic. You know what I mean? Meaning it wasn't like she he was just doing the typical old thing where they would have girls scantily clad over over things to like sell cars because there was a good looking girl on top. It was a wink and a nod and she was involved with it. It was she's not wearing the clothing of the company they're trying to sell. Like that's extremely yeah. ironic and funny. And it worked really well because it was a hipster type brand. So I think if you can sort of respect people's intelligence, humor takes intelligence, you know? I mean, most funny people are smart. You have to be quick. And if you can respect the intelligence of your audience and let them in on the hype, let them yes. in on the joke, I think that's really powerful. And I think it makes it more ethical, honestly. Awesome. All right. Well, Michael F., how Ooh, can people find... Can't wait for find... the book. Can't wait for the book. I know. Uh, what's the book name again? So the book is called The Hype Handbook. It's out in a while. It's out in January, but you can pre-order it on Amazon So, cer or certainly bookmark it yes, if sir. you want to buy it. And my company is called Microfame Media if you're interested in checking that out. Very cool company too. But, but will you be doing yeah. an audio version of the book? Yeah, um, it won't be coming out on January twelfth. Uh, They're still figuring out the details, but there will absolutely be an audio version. At you know, some it's point. See, it's see, I I realize you may only have so much to say about that, and my little idea is not going to go anywhere. But it seems like some great hype for this would be for different chapters of the book to be read by some very unusual people, and that could be hype for a book about hype. I didn't think about that, but that's a very good idea. So, um, yeah. Mark, um yeah. there you, right, right. All right. The idea, man. That was <laughs> Thank you. The BC boys did that, which is a totally different, their, their audio version of their book, all their friends, like Chuck D did a yeah. thing and Snoop Dogg did there you one. Go. Yeah. That's that. Maybe and it that's was very good. cool. Yeah. And how can people connect with you directly? Social media, LinkedIn, et cetera, or email. Yeah, any of the above. So, I mean, my Twitter is Michael Shine. Didn't put the F in there, but it's Michael, S-C-H-E-I-N-1. I'll give you my email. It's mfs at microfamemedia.com. And I'm sure the spelling will be in your show notes, but it's fame, not frame. Some people yes. get that wrong. Yes. You know, LinkedIn, just look up my name. For some reason, they put Michael Francis Shine. I don't know why, but uh, if you look me hell? up, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Microfamemedia.com is the company website. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, Michael F. Shine, thank yeah, you so thank much you for guys. joining you us. Guys thank you. Are fun. Yeah. It was great. What a, what a little like self-contained masterclass on hype for sure. Uh, wish and it... the winner and the winner. The winner of the, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Well, of the improv game. Thank you. 
Well, thanks for joining us, Michael. And thank you all for joining us as well. That's it for this episode of Funny People Talking. Uh, Yahoo! We'll be back next week for another great episode as usual. I don't know how I can top this, Michael F., but still, we'll be back. And so for Elsie. Thanks. And Dresden. Ciao, ciao. Keep thinking. I'm still Mark Rako, and hopefully you're still funny. Bye-bye. That's it? That's the end of the show? Boy, oh boy, what a crock. This was Funny People Talking. No portion of the content may be reproduced or published without the strict written permission of the producers. Connect with our show at Funny People Talking or at our website, funnypeopletalking.com. I'm your announcer, Peter Coleman. Thanks for listening. This is Mouth Media Network, the business of being heard.